service. The reason that we are online is because we've just recently returned from the States. Um, thankfully, we had the opportunity to go and visit Victoria out in the States. It was an excellent time. But the rules were at that point when we were in the US that we had to get a PCR test. Um, and when we arrived home again, at that particular time, we had to get a PCR test and submit that. So because of that, um, it takes a couple of days to get the results, which would mean that we run into Sunday. So that is the reason why we're online this week. But I'd just like to share a bit of a testimony um, in regards to the whole PCR thing um, before we start our service properly. Um, but before we do that, let's just come um, before God in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to come into your presence again. Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you just bestow upon us. And Father, as we think of the new year that is ahead of us, then Lord, we just pray that you would Give us guidance in where we need to be. Give us guidance in what you want us to be in. 
what you want us to be used for. And Father, we continue to ask for a blessing uh, on not only the church family, but all those who we are in touch with. Father, it is a privilege to be part of such a great church family and a wider family as well. And we give you thanks for that. So Lord, as we come, we pray that what is said here today would be to your glory and your honour. And we just ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, as I said, <clears throat> I would like to just share a wee bit of kind of testimony. Um, so often, I think, nowadays, we put a work of God, if you like, we put that into a secular setting. And that can never be in a, a secular setting. Or we try to explain it away in secular terms. And really, sometimes without over-dramatising it, then sometimes we do see miracles happen. But as I say, we try and explain these away in different terms. And this really is a testimony of what you could call two miracles or the Spirit working uh, in our lives in a couple of ways, or God working um, in a couple of ways as well, whatever way you want to define it. Um, but it is an amazing story that I just thought I would like to share, and it kind of fits in with what we're looking at in our sermon today as well. When we were out in the US, we had to get a PCR test before leaving America just to make sure we were negative and not positive. And this is where the first kind of miracle kicks in. Because two out of the three of us tested negative, one tested positive, which meant that we needed to cancel one flight and the one person would needed to have stayed back in America, which in one, one sense wouldn't have been a bad thing, although you would need to have self-isolated. And the other two just get the same ticket to fly home. But when we looked at the electronic certificate, we noticed that the pass passport numbers wearing on the certificate, and that is a requirement for obvious reasons, that each passport number must be on each um, certificate. So we phoned back the pharmacy where we got the test done and asked them to reissue a new certificate with the passport numbers on. During this time, we had already phoned up the um, British Airways to cancel one flight and they were very good um, they issued us with a voucher that we could claim back some of the flight costs which we thought was absolutely amazing um, and then we were sitting and we got the results back with the new passport and one of the the one that was tested positive came back as a negative. They had, something had went wrong um, with, on their side, which they admitted, and whether it was we got the wrong result or whatever it was, we don't know, um, but the <coughs> positive one came back negative, which was a miracle in itself, which meant actually that we could all fly back together Unfortunately, um, we had already booked a new flight to come back um, a good few days later. So we went back on the phone to British Airways and explained the situation and they had said, okay, you can use your voucher, but you will need to pay the difference. Um, you'll need to pay the difference on the flight, which we thought, okay, it's going to sting a bit and it's going to be quite difficult but we just need to accept that and roll with that and we need to pay the difference. Now, 
we were expecting the difference in the flight to be maybe two or three hundred pound, which would have been a fair cop. But when the chap came back eh, on the phone after working out the difference, he says it was going to be over a thousand dollars. Now, as you can imagine, we were taken aback at this. Um, and we phoned on the phone, we said, but surely um, we shouldn't be able to pay this because it wasn't our fault. Um, and um, it was the pharmacy's fault. Now, prior to this, the person who ordered, it gave us a voucher for the flight said, once you have done it, you can't undo that booking. You can't retract that booking. So again, that was okay, that's fair. And we didn't mind that. So then the chap who was on the phone says, wait a minute, let me go and see the supervisor or his supervisor. So he went away and saw his supervisor and you wouldn't believe it. But when he came back, he said, okay, I can put you on the same flight as the other two and we will waiver the cost, we will waiver the $1,050 for the change uh, of flight, for the difference of a flight. And as you can imagine, everybody that was there was just totally blown away by this. Now, as I said, in that story, two things happened. First of all, the positive good test was wrong, which can then came back as a negative test, which was a miracle in itself. But then the other miracle was that they wavered the over a thousand dollar um, difference and managed to get us back onto the same flight. Now, I don't know about you, but when I see God working like that, all you can do is sing, how great is our God. You see, when we put our hand, our, our, our trust and our faith in God, then amazing things happen. And as I say, this kind of ties in with the story or we're going to look at today, which I had actually planned quite a while, uh, a couple of weeks ago. I had did it for today's service, knowing that I would be in America and I would be coming back um, to get this done. And I'm sure many of us know the story that we're going to be looking at. And I think that story actually, for me personally maybe, but I think as churches can relate um, to the time in which we are living. Um, beginning of a new year, um, we don't know what lies ahead of us for the year. Um, we just need to put our trust and our faith in God that everything will be okay. Um, so I think that story relates to the beginning of the new year. And the story that we're going to look at this morning is the story of Gideon. Just a quick summary of the story in case you're not familiar with the story of Gideon. Tremendous story in the scriptures. Then, uh, just a quick summary to the background of it. We see at the start some real terrible devastation for the Israelites. The Midianites were a group of nomadic people who were actually the descendants of Abram, but they were known for, to offer, uh, come and uh, attack different places. They would plunder that place, take everything that they owned and killed the people of that. And they waged a war against the Israel Israelites for about seven years. The really it was a terrible atrocity that actually happened during that time. And as you can imagine, the kind of um the kind of state of mind, if you like, that the Israelites would have been in. They would have been terrified of these Midianites. They would have been so frightened and they would have been crying to their God for help. 
we find the story um, in chapter 6 of the book of Judges, um, where we're introduced to Gideon. We notice that as Gideon was working in his job, it was a wine press where he was working. Um, he wasn't making wine, but what he was doing was he was treading wheat. Interestingly enough, he was doing this in a wine press, and we need to ask the question, why would you tread wheat in a wine press? Why wouldn't you do it out in the open air, out in the fields? The point is that he did it because he was hiding from the Midianites. This great man, as we eventually will see of God, was so frightened of the Midianites that at work he had to hide. But despite this, despite the fear that Gideon had, an angel comes and says to Gideon, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valour. Now, <laughs> I'm not sure about you, um, but as we read through the beginning of this story of Gideon, um, and I don't think I'm doing any disservice, but we really don't see um, Gideon as a man of valour. Certainly he doesn't seem to be that because he's hiding in a wine press, um, threshing wheat from the Midianites. It doesn't seem somebody who is full of great courage. But the interesting thing we all see throughout this talk that God sees something in us that we don't necessarily see. God sees something in you that you might never recognise. And it is, and it goes without saying, that everyone is special to God in our own individual ways. And that is the first thing that we need to grasp. You may be sitting in a situation where you think you're in a bit of a dire straits or you're struggling. You may think everything's coming against you, but God is interested in you. And God has got a special purpose for you. But we see the response that Gideon has to God. And we read this in verses 14 to 17. And this is what it says. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of the Midian. Do not I send you. And here's the response. And he said to him, that is Gideon, says to the Lord, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the hand of the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, if now, I, if now I have found favour in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speaks with me. That's just an amazing story. Here is God saying to a man who sees his tribe, who sees his clan, who sees his family as the weakest in that area. And then he says that he sees himself as the um, as least in his father's house. Again, do we see this as a man of great valour? Do we see this man who has great courage? We're going to look at three things to do with this. <coughs> Excuse me. And really three things um, to do with Gideon. The first is his clan is the weakest. 
The second is, he is the youngest. And the last thing was, is that he needed a sign. First of all, God destroys the altar of Baal. This is the first thing. Although Gideon and his clan may seem like the weakest, let's just see what happens here. God destroys the altar to Baal. Baal, on the face of it, seemed a decent deity. It was the god of fertility, the god of crops. Yes, this god was one of the strongest gods according to Greek mythology and conquered other gods and took on their personas. At the time in question, this god began and was having success infiltrating society at that time. In other words, the balance was beginning to lean towards this God of Baal instead of the one true God. Israel, if you like, um, or that society of that time, was beginning to lean towards and worship the wrong God. This terrible, as we would find out, this terrible, terrible God of Baal and ignoring their own true God. And when I was thinking about that, is society today leaning towards other gods rather than the one true God? This is where God, uh, Gideon, had his first task. His first task was to destroy the altar that the Israelites had erected to this false God, remembering that the Israelites were God's people and they had um, erected this altar um, to this false God. After destroying the altar, we see that Gideon is in grave danger, obviously, of losing his life. We can't go into this whole story. Um, time wouldn't permit that. But we see that he is in grave danger of losing his life. You see, <clears throat> it can be very dangerous to go against the grain, to go against things in society that we may seem wrong. It is dangerous to speak sometimes up for the truth. We might get ridiculed, we may get ignored, we may get accused of other things if we stand up for the truth. And of course, when I'm speaking about the truth, I am speaking about spiritual things that we find in scriptures. They wanted to kill Gideon on behalf of this God of Baal. And as I said, we, we need to remember that this was God's people who were worshipping this false God. You know, I wonder how many of God's people are worshipping the wrong God whatever that might be in society. And at the beginning of this year, maybe again, it's just time to refocus. Time, as the song says, to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look fully into his face. And the things of earth, the things that we see, the things that may infiltrate us, will seem to grow dim. But then as we go on in this story, we see that Gideon lays a fleece. And we read in Scripture, Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, 
Behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is a dew on the fleece alone, and it isn't dry all around, then I shall know you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early next morning and squeezed the fleece, it wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl of water. Then Gideon said to God, Let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it dry on the fleece. Let it be dry on the fleece only. And on all the ground let there be dew. God did so that night. And it was dry on the fleece only. And all along the fleece there was a dew. Now again... We see this man of courage having to get clarification, having to get another word from God just to make sure that what he was saying was actually right. He was so uh, unsure. And not only, I think, so unsure, but possibly so... Um, so lack of courage, he felt so inappropriate um, to be used by God. He couldn't see himself being used by God. So he himself needed confirmation, if you like, that what he was seeing and what he was doing was okay. And remembering this was a man that God saw with great valour. You know, maybe you're like that. Maybe God is speaking to you and God is saying to you to go and do something and you think, you know what, I can't do this. I need more evidence. God, you'll need to show me more before I can do that. Maybe as a church. Maybe the church has been told to go a, to that, a certain direction and the leaders of the church is saying also, look, Lord, we need more evidence for this to happen. But to go back to this um, story, to lay a fleece it means that in one sense you're making sure what you hear from God is correct. Or we could say that Gideon was testing God. Now, I may admit that there are many different views on whether we should test God or not. Um, and I don't want to get into that today. Suffice to say that God tells Gideon to do something. Not only does God realize that he, uh, does Gideon realize that he isn't <clears throat> equipped to do that, but he tests God once by laying a fleece and even that proof isn't enough, so he goes on to test God again. And actually, in that laying of fleece, there is a wee miracle in there as well. Because it says, if we go back to the story, it says, when he rose early in the morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl of water. So this fleece was soaking. God didn't only just put a wee bit of water and say, well, okay, there you go, get in this proof. God says, look, I'm really going to show you proof because I'm going to really, really wet this view, eh, this fleece and get in, wrung it out so there was enough to fill a bowl of water. And you see, God gives us more proof than we ever need. The problem might be is that we don't see it or we don't want to see it. And that is so important. As I say, <clears throat> normally if someone lays a fleece, then they want a sign, they want proof from God. 
By reading this story, the fleece, as I said, wasn't just wet, it was soaked with the dew, so much so that they could wring, out, wring it out and gather a whole bowl of water in it. I think we must conclude from this short summary of the story that Gideon's faith was pretty weak. And I don't mean to do any disservice, but just by reading the story, he needs proof time and time and time again. I don't think this is really a bad thing, as Gideon, who, who we see question God time and time again, God still used him. You know, maybe you have questioned God time and time again. And maybe you don't think you're good enough. As a church, maybe we question God time and time again. God will use you if God has his hand on you. I think up to this point in Gideon's story, we do see also how gracious God is with him. Not only gracious, but he was very patient and understanding with Gideon. We read even Gideon realised that at the time because as we heard in the story Gideon says when he goes to question God a second time Gideon says don't be angry with me. He realises that he's beginning to question eh, God. He's beginning to test God and he says look God don't be angry with me. <coughs> in this story we see how insecure Gideon must have been. God tells him that he's going to have victory and yet as we've read he keeps asking for sign after sign after sign and that is somebody who is insecure. You see, insecurity can attribute to many things. And one of these things that insecurity is attributed to is fear. And one thing that we need to realise that is fear will release, once we overcome fear rather, that will release the insecurity in us. I love the words of a song by Isaac Williams that fear is a liar and how true that is. I just want to read, don't worry, I'm not going to try and sing it, but I just want to read some of the lyrics of that song by Isaac Williams. When, when he told you you're not good enough, I wonder if you have been told, maybe on many occasions, that you're not good enough. You know, God doesn't tell you that. God wasn't telling Gideon that. Gideon felt the insecurity. He knew the fear, and it was real fear that he had, and he didn't think that he was good enough. Or the song goes on, when he told you, you're not right. When he told you, you're not strong enough to put up a good fight. When he told you, you're not worthy. When he told you, you're not loved. When he told you, you're not beautiful. That you'll never be enough. I wonder at the beginning of the new year if his words describes you. I wonder if you've been told that you're not strong enough. I wonder if you've been told that you can't put up a good fight. I wonder if you've been told you're not worthy, you're not loved. I wonder if you've been told you're not beautiful, that you'll never be enough. Well, you know what? Fear is a liar. And God will never ever tell you any of these. You are so precious in his sight. 
The song goes on, he will take your breath away, stop you in your steps. Fear is a liar, he will rob you, your rest, steal your happiness, cast fear in the fire, because fear, he is a liar. You know, we need to realise that God tells us the exact opposite because like Gideon, God sees beauty in you. God sees the worth in you. God will guide your steps. God will give you real joy and real happiness. We need to trust God at the beginning of New Year. He will tell you that you are loved. And we could quote scripture after scripture to support this. The chorus outlines the different aspects of fear which is tied to insecurity, such as how it keeps you from moving forward. It steals joy and robs you of rest. We can't feed on fear. It only grows bigger. We must stop and trade these lies for the truth. And you know what? The truth is, as we'll see next year, next week, the truth is that God loves you no matter what. God has got a plan for your life a plan to succeed, a plan to prosper if we only put our trust in him. So we've actually seen how despite, despite um, Gideon seeing himself as the weakest in that area of that tribe, seeing himself as the youngest of his family, we have seen how God has given him this task to do. And yet, even in that whole thing, and time and time and time again, God reassures him, we still see that God, Gideon, is struggling. And then we come on to our last point. And the last point is how Gideon has victory over the Midianites. There was a movie that was pretty gory, but it was called 300, and it was shown in around 2007, I think. And here we have Gideon and 300 men. This is one of these crazy stories that I do love in Scripture. And let's try to Picture this scene. Someone whose insecurity levels are pretty high and they constantly needed they constantly needed reassurance and then this happens. There are probably around a hundred thousand Midianites. A hundred thousand Midianites. That is a big army. That is a big, big army to conquer. No wonder we see Gideon's insecurities pretty high. Gideon manages to assemble, uh, he man manages to assemble um, 32,000 Israelites. Now, I'm no mathematician. But even I can see the odds are stacked against Gideon at this point. Probably a hundred thousand Midianites and the most that Gideon can assemble is 32,000. I don't know about you, but I would be thinking this ain't enough. We need more. We need more people to fight these Midianites. And again, maybe we are in that situation where we see the odds 
well stacked against us. They are so, so high against us, we think we will never, ever defeat us. It's, I mean, the odds are incomprehensible that they're just so much against us. But listen to what happens. Then he, that is the Lord, said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand save me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned, and only 10,000 remained. So we've went for uh, 32,000 facing 100,000, now to only 10,000 remaining. In a foul swoop, <coughs> Gideon was only left with 100,000. Can you picture the scene? Can you imagine what's going through Gideon's mind when he faces this enormous task and all of a sudden a third probably or half of his men disappear? Then we read further on. The Lord said to Gideon, The people are still so many. Take them down to the water and I will test them for you there. And anyone whom, of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And anyone whom I say to you, the one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue, as a dog laps, you shall set by himself likewise. Everyone who kneels down to drink, and the number of those who lap, putting their heads, their hands to their mouths, was 300 men. 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, wait for it. With 300 men who has lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand and let all the others go, every man to his home. So the people took provisions into their hands and their trumpets and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but he retained 300. Gideon, poor Gideon in one sense, sets out with, what was it, 30,000 and here he's left with 300 men to fight 100,000 Midianites. Now we're struggling. Just less than 1% of the men left. Just remember, still 100,000 Midianites. But you would think God would give, give them at least the latest weapons. Um, you would think God would give the Israelites the greatest um, weapons to face these Midianites, but no. What do they go into battle with? They go into battle with trumpets and jars. You know, this is just a crazy story. The stacks really, the odds are really stacked against Gideon. But it says, and he divided 300 men into three companies and put trumpets in the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And they said to them, look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet and all who are with me then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. As I said, this just seems so crazy. Why would you go into battle with trumpets? 
The upshot of this is that Gideon defeats the Midianites. Why does he defeat the Midianites? Not because the amount of number of, soldier, <coughs> of soldiers, if you like, that he has. Not because he's got the latest weapons in his armory. No, but because of a promise from God. And that promise from God is, I have already given them into your hands. Now you see, even in that, God's plan was for Gideon to succeed even before he had succeeded. God's plan for your life is for you to succeed even before you think you have succeeded. And we come to another aspect of it because God anointed Gideon. It says in verse 34, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. There's the secret. You know, I'm just finishing reading um, a, an amazing book and the <clears throat> beauty of that book that we read is that the Spirit of God came upon an area and that area was revived. You know, it's only with the Spirit of God that we can do miracles, that we can do anything. The idea here is that he was clothed with the Spirit. Interestingly enough, a few weeks ago, we were looking at how we can be filled with the Spirit. And now here we are seeing how we are clothed or dressed with the Spirit. This time of year when there are many gifts that are given, sometimes these gifts are gifts of clothes. And if you're like me, you can't wait until you put your new clothes on. Whether it's a new jumper, a trousers, a suit, a jacket, then you can't wait until you get that on. You're so, you feel so chuffed to be dressed in these new clothes. There is something else that clothes do, and it helps us to be identified. If you think about the different services that we see, whether that's the police, the fire, the ambulance, the nurses, doctors, and so on, we see that the uniform that they have, or the clothes that they have, helps us to identify the job that that person does. You know, maybe at the beginning of 2022, you need to be clothed with the Spirit. Yes, we've been filled with the Spirit, but maybe we need to be fully clothed with that Spirit. And you know, it speaks about putting on the armour of God in the New Testament. Maybe at this time of year, we need to be, we need to have the armour of the Spirit, the armour of God put on. And you know, if we do that, people will recognise who we are. People will see that we are men and women of God. That there is something different, different about us. You know, identity is an amazing thing. As we move into 2022, how are you going to be clothed? Are we going to wear clothes? that others will recognise us as Christians? Are we going to be clothed with the Spirit? Or are we going to use our old clothes as it were? I pray that at the beginning of this year that we are clothed with the Spirit. But another thing that clothes do, it doesn't it just help us to be identified, but another thing that it does it envelops us. When we put on a jacket, it envelops us. 
It covers us. And you know, it's the same with being clothed in the Spirit. That in Spirit envelops us. It totally and utterly covers us, as it did with Gideon. The odds were stacked against Gideon. There was no way that he should have won that battle. And yet, because God had already that planned and promised, because God had anointed him, then he was able to do that. And the insecurities disappeared, and he was able to face that um, battle. Not only, <coughs> not only does clothes identify us and envelop us, but it also empowers us. I'm not sure how you feel when you get dressed up, when you put on the new clothes, or maybe even if you're part of the services, even if you wear your national dress. But it does seem to empower us. Empower us. It does seem to help us to stand upright and think, you know what, I, am, I can do this, I'm pretty good. How much more when we clothe ourselves with the Spirit? That really will empower us for the year to come. And just to finish off, we need to remember that despite the insecurities that we have, God can overcome these insecurities, whether personal insecurities or whether it's insecurities of a church, whatever church you belong to. God has a plan for that church for 2022. God has got a plan for your life in 2022. You can have victory over anything you wish in 2022. And 22. God has already, as we've seen with the story of Gideon, God has already given you that victory. All we need to do is keep trusting, keep having faith in him and defeating these fears. And the way that we can defeat the fears is by put, putting our trust and hope in Christ. Putting our faith and our trust and our hope in God. Gideon had an amazing battle to fight. He didn't think he was good enough. As we saw, he defeated Baal. And I think that's an important lesson. Once we defeat the enemies that come against us from secularism, when we put our trust in God, then that's a start. And then we saw how Gideon has to get reassurance Maybe need, you need reassurance. God has given you that reassurance this morning. And then we see that he has the victory over that army. Why? Because not only was that promise given, but Gideon was anointed. He was clothed in the Spirit. And my prayer for you for 2020, that you, 22, that you will have victory over any fears, over any insecurities, any battle that you need to fight, God will give you that. Why? Because he wants you to prosper. He wants the best for you. And we just pray that as we go forward as a church, that we will defeat, and God will show us where we are to go in 2021, 22. So let's just close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the story of Gideon. And yes, we need to admit, we see that Gideon keeps questioning you, and yet you don't make a difference. Father, even God, we pray, we think how Gideon even tests yourself, and you don't make a difference. Father, we thank you that you give Gideon that victory. Father, you defeat his insecurities. And Father, maybe there's someone listening this morning who does feel insecure, who is fearful of what 2022 might hold. Lord, I just pray that you would defeat that insecurity, that you would defeat that fear, that you would give them, already show them 
that they can have that victory in 2022. And this is going to be a year of prosperity. This is going to be a year of beauty, of blessings. So Lord, we just ask these things in thy son's precious name. Amen. Well, folks, thanks for listening. And next week, all being well, we will still be online, but we will be in person as well. As I say, as long as everything is okay. So take care and God bless, and we'll see you next week.